So tell me, what do you do to stay active now? What are the things you do? And uh, you are now 73. You're going to be 74. 74. Oh, wait, no. You're 74. You're going to be 75 this yeah. year. Mm -hmm. Big 75, man. Yeah. Three quarters of a century. Well, I power lift. Do you power lift? Yeah. That, that, that lift. I can't do it. I, I can't do the squat with the bar. I can't even put a, a, an empty bar on my back. I hit a bone right here, and it's just like a shock. So I do the just the uh, machine where you I can put the uh, plates on it, forty five pound plates, and mm -hmm. do squats with that uh, bench press. And then I do you know I I got a pretty good workout where I do the lat pulls and uh, bent over rows, uh, deadlift, and. Uh, I do a lot of, uh, well, I've been bike riding. I'm going to start again when the weather, weather gets Nice day better. today? Yeah, it's too cold. Okay. Not quite not quite right yet. Because when you start riding, you start moving through the air. Since I lost my prostrate, I uh, pee regularly. <laughs> Especially if it's cold weather. You know? You've been holding your own here during this? Yeah, well, that's because I'm not running water or doing anything like that. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you stay active. You're more active than I am. Well, I I, yeah, I stay much. If I got stuff at home, I do it. different things. Total gym downstairs in the basement, mm -hmm. uh, barbells, you know, dumbbells. And I've been switching now from the barbell workout to a dumbbell workout just to break it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I got pretty good. <laughs> Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> much better than my wet noodle arms. It's good. But, uh, Matter of fact, I'm thinking about going for the championship, Connecticut Championship, APA, in bench lifting, in bench pressing for the... Uh, How much do you want to bench? Uh, well, I want to bench 275. For my age group, that'd be pretty good. Yes. For any I age want to do group, it over 75, when I get it to be 75 years old. Because at that time, I've been looking at the records, and I could beat the record. Okay. So I think I'd take the state championship. But... <laughs> If you can do it, God bless, man. Talk, talk to me about the reunion. All right, the reunion. Let's see. We're going to be leaving on Tuesday morning. And that's mm -hmm. another thing we're going to talk about. We're going to be, uh, there's a flight at 11 o'clock, and it gets in about 1 o'clock to Nashville. And uh, leave it, uh, we could leave about uh, 12 o'clock in the afternoon and get back by 3 on Friday. But tell me about yeah. what's going to happen then. Right, I got to fill in the space now. We got space <laughs> that we got to fill in. We have fill in the space. <laughs> get there Tuesday, leave Friday. Okay. Now what? All right. Now, when we first get there, Luke Hearns is going to pick us up at the airport. You don't want to get a car? You don't want to rent a car? We don't really have to rent a car. If you want to rent a car, we can rent a car. But uh, I like being a little more independent than being attached. We can do that. Whatever you want to do, but. But they say there's, you know, there's transportation that you, you know, you got, you got a car, you got to park it, you got to do stuff. Okay. Where well, you take a shuttle, you just go where you're going. You Never go been to Nashville. I have no idea what to expect in Nashville. Well, it's just a city. You know, I know it's just a city. Yeah, but, but I mean, there's things, things that we could do. All, all, I mean, can I go see some country music? I mean, what are we doing? Country music. Okay. Yeah, well, you're in Nashville. We <laughs> I want some country music. You're going to have country music is what you're going to have. Did you know that Luke Hearns met Anne Margaret? In, in didn't all of you meet Ann Margaret? Huh? <laughs> didn't all of you meet Ann well, Margaret? Well, I, I saw her at the at the Bob Hope uh, Christmas special in Denang. Yeah, but I didn't I didn't get to really meet her. I was like in the third row back. I was able to see her pretty well. That's pretty intimate with her. As far as <laughs> intimate, <laughs> well, you had to see the suit she had on. I can imagine she's there <laughs> I, to entertain I, the troops. There was nothing. There was nothing left of my imagination. Uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I mean it was. It was one of the finest things I did in my life was watching her. But um, he got to meet her in person not too long, a couple months ago in a restaurant. Okay. And he's got a picture of him hugging her. Okay. And Margaret. And I was so pissed off. I son of a bitch. <laughs> How come he... <laughs> he gets it. I don't know. But he was telling her about, you know, how everybody liked the... Uh, her Bob Hope special that they did for the troops in Da Nang and you know how everybody talked about it for quite a few years after like 50 years after <laughs> you mentioned that and the people that went they all mentioned the same thing <laughs> so, what was that in 68? 1968 Christmas of 1960 December okay there you go 
But he said she, you know, she heard that there were some, you know, veterans, you know, Marine Corps veterans over, you know, that table. She went over, she wanted to be introduced to him. He, he said she likes veterans. She likes talking to well, I can to imagine she does. And, you know, you know. Mm -hmm. And Bob Hope did a great job as far as putting those things on. It was, you know, he knew how to put on a show. So who am I running into in this besides Lou and Bob? Joe Jennings, Bob Joe. Nixon. I'm talking about, is there anyone I'm going to meet? Like who? I've named a bunch of heroes to you, didn't you? <laughs> what I mean is, like, I don't didn't know. you say that the chief of staff was there one year? Yeah, well, we had uh, Dunford in uh, Quantico. Mm -hmm. uh, it's no telling. I don't know who they got lined up. Is this a force recon thing it's or a Marine? Force, for, this is the third force, force recon. Third force recon. Yeah, third force. And a lot of people like to go and, and, you know. How many people will be going? We generally have about 50. Still 50 of you left, huh? Yeah. Well, there, you, you got to figure, you know, a lot of people come, when I say 50, that's 25 Marines and, uh, and, oh, and the family. And family, you know. <laughs> plus ones people, like me. Yeah, like you. Like some, I, I, I guys bring their sons, you know. Okay. Their wives, sons, every, you know. But you got to remember, third force, the company is supposed to have like 140 people. Okay. Right. We never had anywhere near that much, but we had, uh, you know, uh, headquarters. We had, uh, mm -hmm. you know, then the, the three platoons uh, that went out in the woods that had the teams, the first, second, third platoon, and headquarters. And then we had a corpsman and, uh, uh, armory and stuff like that, riggers, parachute riggers. And they took care of the scuba gear and the rigging and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So you had, you know, it's so it, you know, quite a few have died. Yeah. A lot of them died. We got Steve Foster just recently. He's supposed to, supposed to get a medal with us, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Lou, you know, he, he uh, gets involved in a lot of this stuff. He, he does a lot of the, uh, organization of it like he'd get involved with getting the silver stars for me and babin and foster and wiley and he was wiley well, that's the other one yeah. they said that they still got to get some uh uh i think major colonel kent they got to get information when he was over there and uh there's another guy that they had that they have to get information on but what is the silver star for huh? what's the silver star for for uh what's knocking the, out the, no but like like what's the is it like valor? I mean, I it's mean, for it, yeah, valor. It's for heroics. For heroics. heroics. Yeah. I got so it. they give they give it to people who are who do something heroic. It's for heroic. Because that's what it says on the thing. If you, you know, I got a the form that was submitted, and it says for heroics. Okay. All right. And the silver star, you got the medal of honor, navy cross, silver star. Then you got the bronze star, and then you got um, combination, navy combination. Uh, and you told me about this, but give me a quick synopsis, a quick overview of why, what is it? I mean, everything you do is heroic, but like what? Tell me, tell me the story. What happened? A quick, quick. We already a, a previous video. We already talked about it, but like, yeah, yeah. I think I, well, we I think we just skimmed around it, but what happened was, well, we were doing the keyhole operations. Okay. Which meant that we were going in and trying to do operations, find out where the North Vietnamese were, mm -hmm. if they're coming closer to the caisson, away from caisson. And we we're also, if we had a chance to call an artillery on them, airstrikes on them, whatever we could do. And sometimes we got in actual combat with them. Okay. You know, gun fi uh, firefights with smaller units, usually. Uh, this time here, they wanted us to go out and find a new, we knew that the main branch of the North Vietnamese Army was moving toward Quezon because our patrols were starting to get in contact with them closer and closer to Quezon. So we uh, sent out six four-man teams in an area that we knew that one of those teams was going to find them. It's going to have to run, run into them. So you're one of six. And one of six, one team, four-man mm -hmm. teams. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we had four-man teams at times is because we didn't have the manpower. to have. Well, what's a teams. typical but, detachment would have been? What would it have been? Like well, they were, they were running six to eight man teams. Okay. All right. But when we got the four man teams, we found out they were more efficient. And so we stuck with them at the beginning. You know, we, we didn't, 
you know, say, well, we want a six man team or eight man team. Most people that ran the four man team said, this is, this is perfect. Okay. You know, we got enough people that go out there and fight and we got enough people. You could move quieter. You could move faster. You didn't have to worry about losing anybody by moving too fast. and have the rear security, not paying attention and being left behind. Who are the people with you? You? It was, uh, Steve Falstrom, Verwick Babin, and Wiley, Richard Wiley. Okay. All right. And, uh, which, uh, I was, I was running point. Babin was the team leader. Falstrom was the rear security and Wiley was, uh, in the middle. Just, yeah, another, you know, he was just a guy. Yeah. Uh, and what we had, what we were doing is we we're going out, we knew it was the 324th. And I found out later elements of the fifth division, NBA division, 324th NBA division. Mm -hmm. And they were thought to be in the area and we knew that the, the attack was imminent. It was going to happen pretty soon. And they were told that the team that ran into him, that found him, probably would not survive. That's your team. That was my team. We happened to be the ones that found him. Mm -hmm. When we got inserted, we were uh, inserted and the helicopter called us back and said, you got movement all around you. You know, you're surrounded. Good luck. We can't come back and get you. And God bless you. Godspeed is what they said, you know. Mm. So we said, all right, we got down on our bellies and we just start crawling. And we were heading out and we passed a, uh, a bunker. And we said, well, <clears throat> we got a, We got a mission to perform. We better just keep going. And luckily we did. And we got into, I got it. I was running point and I got us into elephant grass. That was about, we were in elephant grass about three to four feet high. So we had to get down on our bellies and we had to crawl to get anywhere like snakes through the grass. And we had about a mile to go to get to the high taller elephant grass. And we were pretty well caught up and beaten up. Mm. We got to the taller elephant grass. We were able to stand up. Then we moved through the taller elephant grass and we got into a, a wooded area. And in the wooded area, we knew we could, now we could run the patrol. We could start going. We, we got away from the main body of uh, the enemy looking for us. And when we got there, we made, uh, we were getting late in the afternoon. It took quite a while to get through that. And uh, we decided to set uh, look for a harbor site, which is, means a harbor site is just where you camp at night. You stay. Uh, we stopped, we ate our meal. We uh, picked a spot about 100 meters away from where we ate our meal, and we moved up to that. It was in a thicket, really thick area. That, and we were on the side of a cliff, uh, well, on top of it, because the cliff was, uh, you know. Well, that's good. Back. So you have one side that. One side that they couldn't get to right. that. And the other side, you know, it was kind of rough for them to get to us. But we all night long, we could hear them looking for us, going back and forth. How did they know you were there? Because they saw us get off the, you know, the oh, helicopter okay. come in and drop that's us true. off. They did. <laughs> they drop you off. They're like, oh, look at these guys. Let's go get them. Well, that's what they were doing. They were looking for, you know, recon teams. They had, they had like sapper units that they used to send out. Not sapper units, but they, they were anti-recon units that they sent out that were perfect, that were trained to track and hunt down the recon. <laughs> and that's what we probably had around us. We probably had, a, you know, a unit like that. So we got to... Uh, our site, we slept over that night, and we, like I said, we had noise all, all night long. Woke up in the morning, got out, and we found a trail right, <laughs> right going four, about four meters away from us, going through where they must have come through with it during the night. But we could hear them whistling. Where again. were you, like, how did you, how did you position yourselves? Like, you were just laying in grass? Laying, not in the grass, no, we were in, like, thicket. What's thicket? Well, thicket things with thorns and all kinds of branches and stuff like that. I, mean, I know what thicket like, is, but like, explain. You know? Well, we were, you know, just a bunch of just a bunch it was of growth. bad, a bad growth that was, you know, okay. everything got thorns on it and stuff like that. So we crawled in there and we got, you know, laying down, and just you know, didn't move. Didn't move. Good thing you didn't have a snorer. Yeah, <laughs> I snore now. I didn't then. I, I I don't know when I started snoring, but uh, no, we didn't have a snore. That's good. Was, so uh, we moved out in the morning, stopped, we had breakfast. Yeah, kind of checked out the situation to see what, you know, and we said, all right, let's go. It's not like you We're went gonna... to Denny's for breakfast. No, we didn't go to, <laughs> we had, we had, we used to carry, what well, we had, what well, we had to eat, we had one can of sea rations a day. Or, you know, that was when we carried sea rations, or you had one long range package. But you had different things with it, like, uh, 
a lot of times we'd have some fruit or we'd have uh you know crackers or we'd have uh you know just the things that go along with it, it uh you know you eat part of it you know supper would be the main meal and you know breakfast would be like a cracker or something and we had coffee you had to make a fire to have coffee though so you, you know we didn't want to do the heat tabs which smells like a son of a bitch so we used c4 which <laughs> What do you mean? We used to carry C4 with us because we had to blow something up. Okay. Blasting cops and deck cord and stuff like that. So we take the C4 and you take a little piece of C4 and you roll it up into a little mound and you take your coffee cup thing. It would be like a fruit a can and you'd have one of your bigger cans for C ration cans and use that as a stove. You put the C4 down underneath that, light it on fire, and then put your stuff on and it was just like a microwave oven. It, it, what you, makes the C4 blow up? A blasting cap, an explosion inside it. So otherwise, it's just a it plastic it's, it's, that it just burns. burns. It just burns. Yeah. It doesn't smoke. No, no, that's what they burns hot. Well, that makes yeah, sense. So it's like something that you could you could use in an area. You know, they wouldn't smell it or detect it. it was, you know, but we had uh, we had deck cord with us too, which we used to use to blow up tree. Like we had to have a like you bring the helicopters in, you had trees in the way, you wrap the deck cord around the tree, you get off at a distance. You, uh, you know, they had a blasting cap on it, and you had a, like a, a thing that could cause a spark. It was just to squeeze it, you know? Mm -hmm. And that would go and, and knock that and knock the tree right down. You'd bring about that big tree and stuff like that. Bring them right down without much effort at all. <laughs> you, uh, and we carried C4 with us just in case we had something we wanted to blow up, you know? You never know. You might find a big anthill or something. You want to do that. <laughs> I mean, a number of things you could do with it. Cook with it, but basically, we were cooking with it. But we told her we want C4. So you can cook with it. So, no, we didn't tell her we could cook with it. So just in case we got to blow something up, like a bunker or something like that. We want, so. <laughs> you wake up in the morning, and now what? Yeah, yeah. Huh? And then you wake up in the morning, and now what? Well, we ate. We moved out. First of all, we moved away from the area. Got yeah. right away. And then we decided which way we were going to go or what we were going to do. Because we knew where, where we found them. But we got to really find them now, you know. So uh, I was running a point. And we went down a hill toward the river. There was a river flowing down there. It was between Hill 881 North and uh, 861. And there was a river going through the valley. And then we were heading down toward the river because, there's, you know, see if something's down there. Maybe find them, you know. Mm -hmm. And when we get down there, we stopped and we looked across the river and we could see binoculars barking off the <laughs> people watching us. What they like? You see the shine of them. See the shine, you know. And uh, yeah, you can see the people. And then uh, Falstrom opened fire, and we turned around. And there were a couple of people following us. Oh wow! And he shot them, and so. I said, all right, the Babbitt says, get us someplace where we can fight. I said, okay, I'll get us someplace. And I went up the hill, I brought, you, know, ran, you know, and I got to a, uh, a bomb crater on top of the hills. There are usually bomb craters on top of the hills. And that's why the North Vietnamese used to dig their tunnels in on the side of a hill where the bombs would miss them. Right, right. <laughs> you know, the bombs hit the top of the hill and probably shake them up a bit. Uh, and we got up into the bomb crater, and I had a perfect field of vision. I had like 200 yards I could see. And I had clear, uh, you know, uh, shots. It was first what, time what do you use for a weapon? That. I used an M16 for a weapon, uh, twenty round uh, magazine, and we used twenty rounds. And we used the banana clips because they jammed too much. You know, the thirty round in the banana clip. It wasn't the twenty round clip didn't jam as much as that did. They did jam though. Yeah. So uh, I had uh, I had a good line of fire, field of fire, and I was picking them off. You know, coming down, I could see them. You know, they started coming down. They were going to go around us, which they finally did at some point. But I was picking them off while they were going. And uh, Babin, we were throwing, we had 10 grenades apiece. We threw all our grenades. We had 440 rounds plus a, uh, 460 rounds magazine in a weapon and 40, uh, 20 rounds in my pouches, 20 magazines in my pouches. And 10 HE grenades. We had a couple of smoke, Willie Peter. And we threw all the all the grenades. We used all the. Uh, I was out of ammunition. Everybody was there for Wiley. He had one magazine with ten rounds in it, hmm. and uh, 
we told him to keep that, you know, just in case we might need it. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, the helicopters, we were calling for helicopters for, you know, have someone come and get us or, or an extraction. And finally, the helicopter said, we're on our way. They found some people that were willing to go out and get us. I think the one who came in to get us was a major. And he said, he'll come in. He'll come and get us, right? And so he called out. He said, he's on his way. He says, uh, put, uh, put out a smoke. We had a, green, we had a green smoke and a red smoke and a yellow smoke. Yeah. So we told him, all right, we're putting out a green smoke. We put out a green smoke. He goes, uh, oh, that's not going to work. He said, why not? He said, because we don't know which one you are. <laughs> they were fine. So they were listening. They were listening. <laughs> they were putting smoke out. He said, put out a red smoke. Put out red, five red smokes. Well, what else you got? We said, we got a yellow, you know, yellow smoke. He says, put it out. We put it out. He says, it's all over the place. He goes, he says, they got, you know, all the smoke you guys got. So he said, the only thing you could do, you're going to have to have someone stand up on the hill with an air panel on their chest to bring me in. So it's two guys, if you have two guys, do it. We had four, so we had two guys. Well, I was out of ammunition, so I said, I might as well do it. I mean, you know, you got to bring them in. If you don't bring them in, you're dead anyway. Right, right. And then uh, I got up with mine, and Foster was next to me, saw me get up, he grabbed his, and he got up. And now, what did that look like? Just a... Like, like a, a red, like a, a red, like a mirror type thing? Uh, no, a red, or, a red, a red plastic panel. Oh, okay. So it's not a reflective red. thing. It's... No, it's bright red, and you put it out. You know, so we're, we got him out. We we're standing on the hill, and the helicopter pilot says, "You know, he calls into Babin, who had the radio, says I see them we're coming in." All right. So he started coming in, and he he uh, he goes behind us, and he lands right, and all of a sudden, this guy in front of me stops, pops up with an AK-47, an automatic weapon. Start shooting at me, so but I happened to fall backwards as soon as he started shooting, just before he started shooting, not as soon as he started shooting. And then the rounds went across my chest, so I was laying on the ground, and they're just people going all, all of a sudden. The round stopped, and I got up and I ran for the helicopter. And I was the last one in, everybody thought I would die because it looked like they could see the, the trace of rounds and stuff. Uh, and I couldn't figure out what happened, you know, how come the guy stopped shooting at me. And I said, well, maybe he just ran out of ammunition because a lot of times they only carry three magazines of ammunition. You know, it was, mm. a, you know, it was an automatic weapon fire and they had tracer rounds in it. And later on, I found out he had the tracer rounds because he was the guy who was supposed to shoot down the helicopter. Right. You know, he had the tracer rounds. Just to so, see where his bullets are going. Yeah. His rounds are going. Right. All right. And, uh, you know, and later on, it wasn't until we got a hold of Don Vaughn, who was the gunner on the rear right side of the helicopter, which was the way, you know, toward us, so he could see us. And he uh, remembered us, he remembered us, so, and he got a bronze star for his actions in that patrol. Hmm. And this is just going back about two, two years ago, three years ago, we found him. And because we were trying to get the medals and trying to get, you know, some support. Some recognition, some recognition for this, for right, it. right. And uh, Lou Kearns was doing all the work, and he found him with the 161st uh, helicopter, heavy helicopter uh, unit. And when he said, he, he, he had the same story I had. He said, there's a guy out there. He said, instead of shooting at us, he was, they were shooting at them. He said, uh, the guy with automatic fire, he said he was about 20 meters out. And I'd say, all of a sudden, he was about 20 meters out from the from my position, you know? And uh, same exact thing he talked about the guy. He said, and I blasted him. He goes, I blew him away. What kind of guy, what kind of uh, uh, rounds? caliber machine. Oh, <laughs> would tear him apart? Yeah. I, he, I didn't see it. I was laying back. I didn't see it, but it, it was, it, it's like if it goes by your head and you don't have a helmet on or something, you crack your skull. Just by Without the percussion. Touching it, you well, know, the concussion of it. You know, just, you know, it's, it's a heavy round. They're about that big. You know, so. I mean, yeah, I know. I mean, you know, what that's, yeah. you, know you got the uh, the slug in the, in the powder. Stuff yeah, yeah, like yeah. That. But uh, yeah, they're, they're pretty dangerous. Actually, by the Geneva Convention, you're not supposed to use them on people. You're supposed to use them on tanks and stuff like that, personnel carriers. Well, if that's all you have. Well, then you use them on people. <laughs> if that's all you have. You well, can't just he, let your guy die. You go, I got this. But I mean, it's like, you know, it's just a 50 caliber. That's what they say. You know, they, who are they? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know. You so know. that's where we're, I'm going to hear these stories. That's, uh, what do you think? You think you're going to get this Silver Star soon or what? Probably Matthew will get it when I'm dead. <laughs> He'll be 70 years old and say, what's this? <laughs> but that's what they're saying, that they got a couple of people that's got to make sure that they're 
does a senator or a someone have to represent you or put it in the otter milk we had uh purdue sunny huh sunny purdue sunny purdue and he uh turned it over when he didn't uh, get reelected he turned it over to otter milk yeah you yeah. know and i don't i guess they're to keep a track of it they're doing it <laughs> well, we'll see we'll and see if that shows yeah. up if after i'm going you get it it's just you know I'll go to Tim. You know, <laughs> I'll, I'll put in a frame. So, what do you think of your grandson that might want to go to uh, the Air Force? That's good. The Air Force is good, but I don't, I, don't, I don't know about the situation right now as far as you know. Uh, but he also said he wants to go to the Marine Corps. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, no. He changed. He said, I, "You know what? I was thinking. I think I'll join the Marine Corps." What Andrea you said, "He's you know, gonna, you know, just like his grandfather." He was, I said, "Oh God." I said, yeah, you know, yeah. Send them to the meat grinder. That's a good idea. You know? <laughs> <The meat grinder. laughs> yeah, I don't. <laughs> it's got to be different, though. I mean, it just has to be different than it was. I don't think it's the same. It's not. It can't be. We can't be. There's just too much technology now. It's being used over. I mean, yes, you still need well the weapons ground. and stuff like that. You're training for a different type of warfare too. We we're training for guerrilla war, uh, jungle warfare type of thing. We're wooded area, more or less fighting against guerrilla units, and uh, you know, it, actually, we're fighting against the North Vietnamese Army up where I was. It wasn't Viet Cong. It was North Vietnamese regular North Vietnamese, right? And the big units. Uh, but it was more small arms fire. We used uh, we used jets, phantoms for close in air support with two hundred fifty pound bombs, uh, napalm, and if they're a little further away, five hundred pound bombs. You know, but two hundred fifty pound bombs you can bring close to the to your unit. I got in the head by a piece of shrapnel from a fifty pound two hundred fifty pound bomb. I got knocked out. Luckily, it was just it's all happened to me. But I brought it in danger close within fifty meters. That's. You know, different days are close on different weapons like artillery 105 and 50 meters. Uh, 155 is like 100 meters danger close, and uh, 175 is like 300 meters danger close. You know, hmm. it's bringing it close to your unit. But uh, it was a different type of warfare. It was more of a man to man, hand, not hand to hand, but we we're they like these, they like these kids that are video gamers because they there's a lot of um, you know drone technology. Yeah, the kids are running these drones now with joysticks. Yeah, I know. It, it doesn't seem like fighting to me. It seems, I mean, I'm not, I mean, maybe it's better, but you're still killing people. Yeah, it, it, they're, they're pretty effective. That's the whole thing. It's, pretty, it's a pretty effective way to even get support out to your troops. Right. You're also calling an air support, see, you're calling a, a drone. You got to have the infantry because you got to take control of territory. And if you don't have the infantry, you can't take control of territory. Right. All you're doing is bombing, or you know, shelling. Yeah. You, you know, it's yeah. You know, but you got to have someone to go in and actually actually occupy and chase the bad guys out. And what's happening now, though, it's getting to be more the weapons. I you know that javelin for tanks. And I never wanted to be in a tank anyway because I always knew. I never seen a North Vietnamese tank, where, but I heard them, mm. and you can tell about where they are. We couldn't fire at them, the ones I heard, because they were in Laos, and you couldn't. We couldn't fire in there. Uh, we found drums and different things like that, but I've seen our tanks, and they're sitting ducks. That's a death mm -hmm. trap. Yeah, you know, because if you got a, you know, if I was fighting a tank, I wouldn't be fighting it. I wouldn't put a, <laughs> I wouldn't take a grenade and. <laughs> Throw, throw it down into the down barrel. Into barrel. <laughs> or open okay. the hatch and drop it down. <laughs> yeah. You know, You'd probably I mean, try to take the track off first. Huh? You'd probably try to get from a, a rear position and take the track off. You'd probably come from the back. I would get in a position where I'd, I'd snook it on down and get, you know, just get down uh, and call an artillery. <laughs> you wouldn't try to put a... No. You wouldn't try to put a, a sticky bump? Use your sock? I think you use your sock, a little bit of C4. Yeah. And shoot. That doesn't work? No. That's, what, that's, that's what, what we had the C4 for. Just right. 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 Eating and, and making grease sticky bombs. A grease <laughs> sock. Saving Private Ryan. But uh, That was one of the things in Saving Private Ryan they did. They didn't have anything, but they had socks. They had grease. 
They had some C4. C4. Or whatever. Uh, whatever. Or, uh, not C4, but... Uh, plastic. Yeah, well, some, whatever they do. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you call that... You call, what they did What they did at the Battle of the Vault is what they uh, were... What their, uh, the tactic that the infantry used was when the tanks came, you pulled your men back and you called it artillery. And so where are, the artillery, did, where are the artillery positions? Where, where are they? Like, how do you, I mean, they have to be in a, like, they're mortars, basically. Coming well, out. our artillery, you know, uh, when we're running the uh, keyhole operations, our artillery was a caisson. They had, the, that was an artillery base. What's the range of a mortar? Is that what we're talking uh, about? Mortars? Is, I'm not talking about mortar. I'm talking about artillery. Rock, you're I'm talking, talking about rockets. I'm talking, talking 175, 155. Okay, I think, I'm thinking, I mean, listen, I'm. <laughs> What the hell do I know? I don't know anything. I, I don't the know anything. Carried. I'm assuming they drop the thing in and no, whoop. no, that's that's artillery to me. No, you so you're the back of the thing. You got to you, you shove the freaking thing in the back. <laughs> shut and the door. The bottom, bottom. Boom. <laughs> okay, do it again. So you're, you're talking about a big gun on a big wheel. You open the back. You shove the thing in. Close the door. You pull whatever you pull. Yeah, and, and you uh, freaking pull your ears. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> there was an army army unit up in the DMZ when I was patrolling the DMZ, and they weren't supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. It was just supposed to be me and my team, and that was our area. And we could hear the tracked vehicles coming, and they're firing by mm -hmm. either uh, recon doing recon by fire. So I called up on the radio, and I said, "We got uh, an army unit up here." I said, "They're uh, actually kind of dangerous because they're coming toward us and they're firing." And he said, "All right, we'll get a hold. See if the army has anybody there. They got, you know, they do the units that, you know." I said, 40 mic mic unit, forty millimeter guns." On okay. It. And uh, they uh, got a hold of a guy that was supposed to be out in the area somewhere, but not there. And they talked to him, and he he swore to God he was not where I said he was. And he said, "That's not me. I'm not there. I'm not in that area." I said, "All right." And said, "If it's not him, it's got to be a North Vietnamese." And I said, "Got nothing else." Said North Vietnamese unit with forty bike bikes coming down the road. And I called it in as an artillery strike, and I called it for a spotter round. And I could spotter go, round. A spotter, yeah. The round is a smoke round that you could see and you could adjust off of it and get your target. Okay. So I thought I put it over fifty meters in front of his lead vehicle. You know, because I could hear him coming. I, I put it about ten meters in front of his lead vehicle. <laughs> And he had this way a little bit. And he had a uh, yeah. he had he had a, a change of heart of where he was. <laughs> so we uh, I said it in. I I I didn't want it that close to him, I, you know. But when you're doing it, you know, blind, right? You're just going in a direction, and you know, the sound and you know where you think it would be. Mm -hmm. But I was pretty young. I, I you know, it didn't. No one got hurt, luckily. But uh, yeah, still pretty dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's the fog of war. You don't know. You know, he didn't know where he was. He's firing he at you. He doesn't place. know where you were yeah, or he, who you were. Well, I knew where I was. I knew where he was. But he but didn't he, know who you were. He didn't know who you were, no. Well, we dressed, we didn't dress like the regular infantry anyway. We wore the soft hats and the, uh, you know, camo uniforms and stuff. We didn't wear flak jackets. We didn't have, you know, like the, the infantry wore flak jackets and the helmet, the steel, steel pots. We wore uh, soft covers. You know, it was quieter going through the woods and we traveled. What we did is we tried, we carried, as little extra stuff as we possibly could because we had to carry water and ammo. So we carried one meal a day in sea rations or long range rations or sea rations. So you'd have the crackers in the morning? Yeah, well, we yeah, we split it up. You, you get a box, we come in a box at the meal. You used that breakfast. <laughs> it's really just a cracker. <laughs> well, <laughs> they were crackers, is what they were. Sometimes they came with a little cheese thing on top. So. Do you want to talk about Agent Orange? Anything you want to say about Agent Orange? Oh, Agent Orange sucks. They, 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 they uh... you know, without, you know, just, well, they, without uh... disparaging anything or anyone. I mean, I understand Agent Orange sucks. Yeah. But, you know, just, I'm just wondering if you wanted to comment on that. Well, I, Agent, well, you know, with my condition, Agent Orange. It's bad. That's why I'm asking you. Yeah. They don't know your condition. All right. So we, we got sprayed by it one time. We had the planes. I, I forget the nomenclature for the planes going over. But they, they were smaller than the C-130. It was like a 120 
seven or one twenty three. So I forget. But three of them came over and they sprayed us. And uh, we when we when they were coming, they told us to put on our gas masks. You know, they knew it was dangerous stuff. And when we got out, we came back. They said, "Oh, you guys better get washed up real good and get this stuff off you." You know. Because they say it's bad for you. That you know, you get it on your skin, and you do something that gets into your, and it stays with your body. If, they, if anything ever happens to you, and, it, and I think they were talking about prostate cancer too at the time, and they said it would cause prostate cancer and different things. Even back then, back then, mm. said you know, uh, they weren't coming out with it too, you know, uh, you know, warning people about it. They're saying, "No, nah, don't hurt you. It doesn't do this stuff." And, you know, but the commander we had he said, "No, it does that stuff." It's not good. It's dioxin, and that's not good for you. And so, uh, yeah, we were told, we were warned about it. Then in uh, about uh, 1978, a little before that, I was uh, with the uh, Veterans, you know, the Vietnam Veterans Association in uh, Manitou Community College. I was going to college there. And they said it, uh, People, they said, we want you to go get yourself tested and see what they say, you know, because we're hearing some bad things about them. You know, get all your information together. You go, uh, you know, send in, get it from the Marine Corps, get all your patrol, all your military records. Your DD-214, make sure you got a uh, notarized copy of your DD-214 and go down there with your DD-214 and see what happens. Let us know what they do. They've been taking DD-214s away from the soldiers, the Marines, and they've been... Just hide them. They just well, hide. In those days, if you went in there with one leg, into the VA with one leg, they swear to God you had two. They swear to God you have two. But then after a while, and it was under uh, the Obama administration, actually, and the uh, Bush. And, but, but it was a lot of work done by the VA Veterans Association. We did a lot of stuff to try to straighten this out and complaining and all mm -hmm. that. And once the... Uh, once the Vietnam veterans got into the VA and became leaders in the VA and in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, veterans of foreign wars and the American Legion and all this, then things started changing. They started changing stuff. They said, because we had a, a motto, never again, never to any American troops are they ever going to do this to them again. So under yeah. Obama and Bush, I guess Bush then continued then with Obama, it, it's, it's straightened out. It was, it was straightened out. None of under Trump, it really got straightened out. It was really nice. There's a lot of people that claim to be in the military that are not, that have never been, have never served, or at least have not performed the duties that they they said they have. Um, they might, instead of being on the front lines, they might have been someone who refueled trucks or refueled, you know, uh, machinery, fixed machinery. So, what do you think of those people? Like, what what are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on people that claim to be, you know, to do what you did? Well, the thing is, when you hear them talk, if you were there, if you were in the military, you know they're full of shit. You know, you yeah. can pick that up right away. Mm -hmm. I had a guy tell me that he was uh, Special Forces Marine Corps, mm -hmm. and he was stationed outside of Hanoi. You know, that's what he, I said, what were you in, the Special Forces Marine Corps in the North Vietnamese Army, or what? I said, because the only people up there were North Vietnamese. He said, me and a couple other guys were up there spying on them. So Hanoi, oh. Hanoi, <laughs> Hanoi is? North Vietnam. Mm -hmm. At the time, it was North Vietnam, way up in North Vietnam, where American troops were, we stayed in South Vietnam. Is that where Jane Fonda went to go see those troops back then? Jane Fonda went to Hanoi, yes. Did she go to Hanoi? Yes. Okay. That's why they called her the Hanoi Jane? When she was on the attack on the, doing... Uh, trying to shoot down American planes or whatever she was doing. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I always thought that she had her right. You know, that's what we're fighting for. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of press. Right. Which we don't have now. Right. Which we got to start fighting for again. We got to get that back. You know, and that was the whole thing. A lot of people back then that were in the service respected them for the right to say what they wanted to say, their opinion. Yeah. And they believed they were fighting for that. I believed I was fighting for that. So I'm a little bit aggravated now that they're taking it away. Just some bureaucrat someplace decided that we can't have freedom, freedom of speech anymore. No one voted for, voted for it's it. It's less about bureaucrats, though, Dad. It's more about, um, it's like this willingness of businesses and individuals to be part of the system with the government. Well, this is how many people go along with it. It's surprising. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. <laughs> you mentioned a reunion. You're going to a reunion 
Right, we're going you're, to a reunion. You're yes, bringing so. me along. Yes, I am. Yeah. You're I need some knowledge. <laughs> I need some military knowledge. I don't know anything. So you could be a wannabe, huh? No, I'm not going <laughs> to. Go tell everybody. I'm not going to be a. You won't be telling people outside of Hanoi. That's a real story. See? Yeah. see, when you see those people that want to be, you don't want to give them any real stories. Well, we don't have to mention names, but there are two in, in the news right now that uh, during the Ukraine conflict here, that they, they, really, they really did, um, I don't know, fake their stories. One's a reporter and another one like an independent contractor and they've been caught lying over and over. I mean, there's a lot of lying going on. We, we don't have to get into the politics of Ukraine, but there's a lot of lying going on back and forth with this conflict. I don't know if you have anything to say about that, but uh, I imagine there is. There always was. During the I mean, Vietnam, the propaganda awful, machine, everything is. It's there are an awful lot of people that uh, claim to have been in the service during the Vietnam War. Yeah. After, you know, about 10 years after the war was over. Mm -hmm. After we got out, after, you know, then you started seeing these people come and claim it had been there during the war. Most people, even if you were there, you're claiming that you weren't there. <laughs> you were, right. You don't you know, know. If you went to college or something, you didn't want people to know that you were <laughs> yeah. a Vietnam veteran, you yeah. know. But we did have the, the Vietnam Veterans Association that most people did join. And, you know, but you mm -hmm. didn't, you kept it a little bit low pro, profile. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. It was, wasn't, uh, well, I, I could tell you why most guys did it, but I'm not going to say it here. You, yeah. You know, they wanted to keep a low profile. Well, yeah, no, not keep a low. They wanted to go out with girls. <laughs> the girls were all hippies. And, you know. the girls were hippies. <laughs> nice. So if you want to go out with a girl, you yeah, you could tell you had to you know go along with the program, you know. Right. Yeah, I had. I remember before I went to Vietnam, there was a girl that I met in the bar. It was. You Do know, you want to go through this story? Yeah, it's not a bad. Go story. okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. I'm not going to embarrass you. Go ahead. Do but, your thing, uh, man. She, uh, you know, she was talking. Said, you know, have you been to? V I was in the Marine Corps, and she said, have you been to Vietnam yet? I said, no, I haven't been yet, but I'm, I'm getting ready to go. Yeah, you know, I had mm -hmm. my orders. I was going to go. So I'm going to be going. She goes, oh, do me a favor. If you run into people, don't shoot anybody. You know, shoot over their heads. <laughs> And they're thinking to myself, what do you want to get me killed? Or what are you, are you nuts? You know, but of course I said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I'll do. It's kind of been a weird time. <laughs> it's had to have been a weird time because, so, okay. So we went through a period from Vietnam to now, to 2023, where, I don't know. I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong, but during Vietnam, you, any veteran didn't have uh, a good reputation in society during the Vietnam Era. Right. And then, well, it all depends who you were talking to. Well, that's true. And it's very surprising. You'll see, I found it very, like most people were talking about the hippies. Yeah. They were more or less, they, uh, they weren't mad at us. They weren't, you know, they felt sorry for us. Okay. All right. Interesting. And they, they wanted to know, you know, their interest, what happened, the real story. They're getting so much stuff going on. And, and, uh, they they were they were bad. I mean, you know, they treated us pretty well. It was the Second World War veterans that gave us a hard time. They were telling us that we weren't in a war, that it wasn't a war. They were trying to get hmm. the money out of the VA from what it was uh, signed for the veterans of Vietnam for to put it into the uh, uh, the pot where they could use the money. You know, put it into right. You know. And uh, hmm. I, matter of fact, I went into the VFW once, and I didn't never went back. Mm. Because it was uh, well filled with World, World War, War II, II, yeah, World War II in Korea, and they, you know, I heard it from a couple of guys. You know, you weren't in a war. <laughs> and I'm saying to myself, I wasn't. Where were you stationed? I asked one guy. He says I was down in uh, Norfolk, uh, the Navy Yard down there. I said, during Virginia, the war? yeah, there's a war in Virginia, <laughs> yeah, in World War II, yeah. He spent. And this and, is what I mean. <laughs> this is goes back to the stolen valor. These guys. I'm not saying all the guys in the BFW, and I'm not in, in any way disparaging a, a World War II guy, but when someone tells you I was stationed in Norfolk. Well, and the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Navy, Navy Yard. Yard. That's stolen. <laughs> that, that be, that, it's like stolen valor because they, they, they're, I don't know. It's something about, I'm not saying that we don't need those people and they should be honored as military. Well, they're in the military. I understand yeah. that, but it's like. Well, I've seen a lot of stolen valor. I mean, you were in some firefights. Yes. Some pretty bad firefights. Four, five against a thousand. Also, uh, four against a thousand. Four against a thousand. Yeah, and and you have someone telling you, 
at the VFW, you weren't in a real war, and they were stationed at the Brooklyn Yard. And I never heard of anybody being in a firefight like that and beating a, the 324th and the 3rd Division with four guys. I mean, during the Second World War. But it happened during Vietnam. I was there. Because, yeah, well, <laughs> World War II was a different fighting style. We didn't really, I mean, I'm sure we had reconnaissance of clearly. We had reconnaissance. We had special forces. But most of the fighting you hear about is just infantry, just rush for the most part and am i correct in world war ii world war ii was uh tanks tanks it was tank, the tank air uh, tank with naval. an infantry uh, yeah. division or whatever well, you got a tank you gotta have 10 men around a tank to right. security to make sure no one comes from behind you well you, blind get, you, get, you got different blind spots in a tank you don't have it you know i don't know about the new tanks they got nowadays but God, uh, they have cameras everywhere now yeah i mean they see everything but uh but in those days it's like you see you ever see like in the movie uh, they used to have uh a commercial it was before your time, but it was like trying to get kids to join the army. Yeah. And they have the tank over a berm and it yeah, goes yeah. flying over. It goes right. to, well, Alone. the ones I've seen, if you go over the berm and hit it on the other side and the track will fall off. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, yeah. <laughs> so you had to have people around to protect the tank. You know, it wasn't. Yeah. You know, <laughs> except for the only tanks I've ever seen that really could work real good. Were the T thirty sevens that the North Vietnamese had from the Russians? Oh jeez, I mean, they were they went anywhere. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> You're a tank out there. Is that one of ours? No, it ain't one of ours. <laughs> what do you think about what do you think about the movie Saving Private Ryan? You were not in World War Two. No, I wasn't. But what do you think about the way in which they filmed that? Does it seem accurate from what you understand? It, the, the, the storming of the beach. The day. storming of the beach was pretty. Accurate. I mean, some of the other stuff was just a lot of a lot of uh, that was a pretty bad. Uh, they expected more yeah. casualties during the the storming of the. Well, they beach. got quite a few casualties. Oh, yeah. I forget what was it, six thousand or something like that. I don't even know how many that day. Yeah. We can look it up. I type in casualty Omaha and it gives me Omaha uh, neutral of Omaha. Neutral of Omaha. <laughs> great. We're about to find some sticks. <laughs> No, that's <laughs> that's Omaha Steaks. <laughs> Ew, got some prices. Sixty-eight hundred were uh, experienced combat. Um, well, hold on. And I believe it was mostly Americans on Omaha and Utah. Right. Yeah. And the Canadians and the British were on. The and they had French too mm -hmm. that landed. Uh, well, whatever was left of the French. Anyway. Well, yeah, the the free French was it? The, yeah. Uh, but they were out of the war way before we got into it. They, and the first troops to fire on the American troops in North Africa? Were Chinese? Europe? No. No. <laughs> Say that again. The, the first, first troops. The, two, the, the <laughs> first people to fire on our troops. Yes. When they hit the, when they're going to we're North French. Africa. We're French. Yes. I knew that. <laughs> I don't know why China was in my head. <laughs> China. That's yeah, what it was. No, darn Chinese. <laughs> Down uh, Viet Cong when they bomb the and all that. All right. Um, so we talked about, I, I was asking about Saving Private, Private Ryan, but that movie doesn't relate to you. It has nothing to do with the Vietnam War, no, but it's, but, you know, it um, seems pretty accurate for a landing for, you know, it was mm -hmm. it was pretty bad. Yeah, of course. There's no yeah. ifs, ands, or buts about it. And they did it, they, they showed what death was like more than what you see in a normal movie. Usually the guy has his last words, he could say something or, you know. Right, in this case, yeah. This, this 50 Cal just got, like wiped people's legs off, uh, took people's legs off, opened their guts, you know. Or when they died, they died. Yeah. You know, the ones that were shot, you know, they were they were just dead. It was just no famous last words. No, and there didn't seem to be much glory in it. I mean, where they didn't have the music that, uh, you know, most uh, war war movies have that yeah. uh, show it as a, a gallant thing and everybody's gun hole trying to go you know it, it showed the, the fear you, you could feel the fear going in getting off that imagine getting right. off that thing that the, the front of it comes down and, and you have see. to go out yeah and, you see all the dead bodies out in front of you you know it's, it's, not to see the dead bodies and, you see, and, and, you're in the back of it you see the people in there with you just being mowed down because yeah. they just trained their guns right on that well they had they had one guy you know read the article on him that he was a german and he had a machine gun position up on the hill and he was just, he said he was just mowing them down. He couldn't believe it. He, he, he kept firing until he finally ran out of ammunition. There was nothing more he could do, but he was there for hours. Yeah. Just mowing people down. Just, you know, and, uh, you know, it's incredible what they had to go through. That was a, that was a pretty bad landing. Yeah. Was there any other way, you, looking back, I mean, again, you, you look like you were, you were a 
not even alive at this. Yeah, I wasn't alive. Point. But know if you know in the history, do you think there was a? I mean, that's the only way that they could have done it. I mean, the Germans had all all the positions well, covered. They had they had other plans. They were talking about coming through the under soft underbelly of Europe, which would have been through Greece. Like, yeah, like Mediterranean, Italy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, southern France. If there was, you know, but. Uh, they said no. They wanted to go. They had to go right after the German forces. If they did lose a lot of men just coming through fighting, fighting at, uh, all these other ancillary forces. Yeah, the Italians, whatever. Well, yeah, it'd be the Italians and South, you know, the French and South France and stuff like that. They'd be fighting people they didn't want to fight. And so they would have, you know, probably been able to make it, but they would have just well, you spent so much energy to do. Take that. a look what it did that with uh, Italy going through Italy. You know mm -hmm. they uh, they got stalled pretty pretty much there at Anzio Beach and all that, uh, and and they never got through the Alps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's a good point. it was in forty two, I think. <laughs> they hit Sicily first, then they went into Italy after North Africa. Mm. Yeah, and it it just it amounted to nothing. It didn't do anything to to interfere with the German uh, war machine. Right, and they had to go right at it. So I, that's the only thing I can think of why they did it like that. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw that movie, A Bridge Too Far. No. It was a landing, a smaller skilled landing more in the Netherlands. Okay. And uh, it didn't turn out too well, but, uh, you know, it kind of bothered So they just had to go frontal, frontal assault. That's it. We're going in. That's yep, it. Just, that was it. Just nothing. Let's just, just start shock, piling people. shock and all. It yeah. As many, well, they had all. battleships out uh, that were, you know, pounding, the, pounding in the area, but, it, you know, they had those bunkers built, so. So well that they could uh, they could survive feet it. The multiple blast. feet thick yeah. concrete yeah. yeah and the uh, the air force and another thing that happened with the air force back then they had a line of troops that had advanced and the, our own air force blew them up oh jeez <laughs> you know, well friendly fire happened friendly fire happened but this was like a real bad yeah. mistake on it it was uh, more than. So it kind of stalled the advance right there. Our own Air Force did it. That's you know. That's, so that's how bad it was. That's the coordination and stuff. That... Is there a movie that represents um, your Vietnam experience uh, that you could point to? Well, not Apocalypse Now. I'll tell you that much. We <laughs> all didn't go native and you know <laughs> shave our heads and <laughs> start start carrying spears. <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming you. There were two that came out around the same time, and uh, uh, one was Platoon, and you took me to that when I was a kid. You took me to yeah, that yeah, to go see, and then the other one was Full Metal Jacket. Full Metal Jacket was completely different than Platoon, though. I think yeah, Full Metal Jacket was more like city or town to town, a lot of town to town fighting. I think. Well, Full Metal Jacket was. I'm trying to think. Uh, it was a Marine Corps, anyway, Full Metal Jacket. Okay. And they showed boot camp and all that before they got oh, okay. there. Uh, but Platoon. And Platoon was the Army. And it was basically, you had the, the makeup of the guy, the, uh, the, the lifer, mm. you know, uh, and then the hippie in there that's, you know, that's doing it or the young, you know. You know Charlie Sheen was in that. Charlie Sheen was in it. Odd uh, movie for him to be in. Well, it was it was pretty accurate. I mean, you know, as far what do you think when we left that theater? Because that was in the eighties, and I was a kid. I don't, I don't even know what I watched. I don't even know what I saw. I didn't even understand what I was watching when you took me there. Well, the, thing, the things I saw on it, it was like they were on that patrol, and they had you know people come up on them, and everybody was confusing, and everybody was shooting it, mm -hmm. and that's about what it's like. I mean, you know, just you know when you get sprung upon like that, mm -hmm. and it, you know it it, it showed. Uh, uh, it, you know, it just wasn't like, you know, everybody just stands up and just, you know, charges and, hmm. you know, showed what it was really like, basically. More of what it was like than a lot of the movies I've seen. Mm -hmm. You know, especially the Green Berets with John Wayne. <laughs> well, that goes back to The Longest Day, I guess it was called, with John Wayne. Wasn't John, John Wayne, Wayne was being... Well, he, that was that was uh, that was so uh, he was a paratrooper and uh but wasn't he carted around like on a, on a, a cart barrel yeah because he, he broke his leg he broke jumping and the parachute jumped and broke his leg <laughs> what a mess <laughs> what a goofball huh? i don't think they would have done that for him a bucket of worms the guy was that would be called someone did that and jumped it he'd be called a bucket of worms 
<laughs> oh, man. So tell me about this reunion we're, we're going oh, the to. The reunion we're going to go to uh, Nashville. We're going to meet all the guys we've talked about all these years. Barry Babin, mm -hmm. Lou Kearns. They're all going to be there. All the guys you've been mentioning since the 80s. They're all going to be there. Everybody, Everybody's going to be there. Uh, Joe Jennings, Bob Lansing, the most shot man in the world. <laughs> I don't know any of these people. Look at him to show him his bullet wounds. That shrapnel wounds, actually. You think this is the last one you're going to go to? I think it is. I yeah. think it's going to be the end of it. Yeah. Why isn't it Nashville? Why Why not D.C.? Where, didn't you go to one in D.C.? We went to one in, in Quantico. Mm -hmm. By D.C. That's where it should be. In Quantico. Well, we went to Quantico. This is where people, I don't know. They try to find a spot. Like, people got to come from California. And the people got to come from the East Coast, the yeah. West Coast, the mid Midwest. So they go, sometimes they'll have it in California. Sometimes they'll have it in the Midwest. Sometimes they'll have it on the East Coast. One of the favorite spots to have it is down by the Camp Lejeune. Have a good time down there. I mean, you go through the base, you yeah. get to fire the, not fire the weapons, but they have like uh, simulated fire uh, rooms where you could see that they have a, like a, a movie or a picture up on the, on the wall and you, you got the actual weapon. Mm. But they got them set up so that they, mm. uh, you know, when you fire them, it's just like an electronic pulse going out. Interesting. Yeah, you know, but it's it's fun. It's, you know, a lot of things to do. You see. So the, what am I what am I going to experience here? So what's going to happen? A lot a lot of stories, a lot of stories being told at this thing during dinner. Well, I, come on! I'm not saying fish stories. I'm not saying fake stories. No, no. Stories. I mean, but yeah, people tell stories. Everybody re reminisces about the good old days, you know. How much of their reminiscing? Remember is, when uh, Doc Holliday shot back more? You know? <laughs> how much of their how much of their reminiscing is is embellished? How am I gonna? Well, the, the reminiscence is getting to, like I last time I said, gee, that's over fifty years ago, you know. But that's what I'm saying. But like sometimes, I'm... sometimes you come in with bring out the same story, and sometimes you come in where people got a little different twist on it. It makes, yeah. I, I'll go out with my friends, <clears throat> not military. I'd go out with my friends, and they, they, they'll tell me stories of something that happened when they were teens. I'm like, that's not how it happened. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, it, you know, I've, I've had that. You say, no, that everyone's the hero. You know, like the stories. Everyone's a hero in the story. It's all they're all the main. <laughs> yeah, the main characters. Yeah, was, that's how life is. You know? If it wasn't for them, the war would have been lost. Right. And then you got to remind them, well, the war was lost. You know? <laughs> Theoretically. <laughs> Theoretically, it was lost. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that battle wasn't, but you know, yeah. lose any battles. What do you think is going to happen with Ukraine now? Seriously. What do you think about that? I, I, not politically, but just in general. Just, I mean, this is a different time. We don't have the, we don't have the, I don't believe we have people that uh, aren't recruiting numbers down. Yes. But everything's becoming much more automated, you know, much more remote control, much more, um, I don't want to say AI, but there's a lot more of that. What they're doing now, there's a big, big mistake what I'm seeing. I, they're not looking at uh, war fighters. That's what I'm saying. They yeah. got they got this woke thing coming in where they're, they're talking about, you know, everybody's got to be woke in the pronouns and all that. They're getting rid of the sniper that unit out of the out of the Marine Corps. Why? I guess you don't, they weren't woke, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but that was one of the, uh, you know, it was a tough school to go to. And they accomplished quite a bit. I don't understand how the woke movement, and that we're just using the word woke, but I don't know how that movement fits with the military because you're, you're not supposed to be anything in the military, but a military. Everybody's supposed to be war. Like war you're fighters. just, you're not, you're not, you're not an individual. I don't believe. I mean, you are part of a unit, right? So like everybody's green, right? So like if you're there and. And you're you're demanding certain things like there's not supposed to be any distinction like that. No, that's what I'm saying. That's, that's what I mean. You can't that. have a cohesive unit if you're going to be doing. That. How do you have a cohesive? You unit? don't. Yeah, you don't. What do you think about the youth today? What do you think about your grandson? And I, well, I, I first of all, you're biased. So about the grandsons. Well, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say one of your grandsons is probably going in the military. That's why I'm asking. But go ahead. Yeah. Talk well, if you leave them. Oh, you know what I heard? I was watching a movie. You ever hear knock on the door? No. What's that? It's a movie. Okay. It's about the apocalypse. There's so and many of those. Four people come over and they're, you know, normal people and stuff. And they uh, come to this cabin out in the woods. They knock on the door and they go in and they tell the people that uh, in order to save the world from the apocalypse, you, one of you is going to have to, you're going to have to shoot one of you. Okay. And that's the only thing that can save the world from the apocalypse. And they go, go into things. And one guy was a school teacher. One of the, they were the four horsemen. 
of the apocalypse. Okay. One guy was a school teacher in his life. And he said that you got to be very careful when you're talking to kids. He said, I know that everything you say, they believe. You, so you've got to, when you're talking to them, you got to make sure that everything you say is the truth. Because whatever you say, they're going to, it's going to be a doll, it's going to be embedded in their minds, and they're going to remember it for the rest of their lives, just the way you said it. So be careful of what you say. And uh, I, that, I think, is one of the biggest problems that we have right now. A lot of our school teachers aren't careful in what they say. They're not looking at the things they're talking about and not looking for the truth. They got ideology above the truth. Mm -hmm. And that's what's ruining the kids. But as far as the kids go, depending on where they're from and what family is, same as it always was, they're pretty darn good. They're pretty sensible. And a lot of us see through this stuff that is going on and they know that it's not exactly what it should be because their, par their parents gave, opened their minds up a little bit, gave them a little more mm -hmm. information to go by where they could judge what they're, what they're being told. But I noticed that myself. When you talk to kids, you got to be careful what you say. Make sure that what you're saying is the truth. How the much of the brutal truth should you tell kids in the beginning? In the beginning, you don't want to tell the brutal truth. Uh, you don't want to lie about it. You don't want to lie about it either. Sometimes some things you don't talk about until they get a little older. Okay. You know, you got to do it in stages. You don't just come out and tell them how terrible the world is, right, Brock? You know, so they start talking. You start, <laughs> Welcome to the world. Yeah. It's a terrible place. <laughs> so good luck. <laughs> I mean, you got you got to make, you know, you got to have like your Christmas and your Santa Claus and your, I mean, look, they believe in Santa Claus. They believe in the Easter Bunny. They believe in the Tooth Fairy. They believed in all kinds of things. I mean, I proved that. A, you know. <laughs> but I mean, I did a lot of that stuff just so that later on I could talk to them and say, you know, you believe this? Well, didn't you believe in the dignity yeah. dog at one time or the banshee? Or... The banshee. <laughs> you only know, you know the story of the banshee. And you don't it's like terrorize you know, these grandkids. And, you know, and by now you know that they're, you know, they, they were just figments of my imagination. You know, I made them figments of your imagination. Right. <laughs> and that's, that's the way it works. That's the way it works. And people uh, are letting their kids go through this in schools and things that are completely not scientific whatsoever. They're being drummed into these kids' heads. I mean, you got kids so afraid of climate change. They don't think they're going to live. Right. They don't think their life is worth it because, I mean, they're going to die anyway because of climate change. So the climate change. And they're not. Child suicide's up. Teen suicide, it's up pretty It's been up there. Yeah. That's because of what these people are doing to these kids. Yeah. It's got a lot to do with it. I talked to I talked to my son, your grandson, last night. We were talking about stuff. And he he was making the comment that it's not that he doesn't believe in America. He doesn't believe in the people running it at all. I mean, he shouldn't. He he likes there's some people he likes. Like he likes his football team and he likes, you know, he likes his coaches. But when he starts seeing, you know, because social media exposes way too much, he's you know, 17, social media shows everything. And a lot of it, a lot on social media, I make this comment that I've been lied to all my life. Yeah. Well, imagine how much worse it is now with social media. Yeah. Like people are living lies on social media. What do you think of social media? I mean, do you, do you know enough about TikTok and Instagram and Forget about Facebook. That's like an old person's place. Now. Yeah, I know. I know. I, I, I know that. Uh, Twitter. Like, what do you well, think? Well, it's becoming a virtual life for these kids. Yeah. You see them, I, I, you know, you go to the gym and you're watching people work out and they got their phones with them and they're talking. Yeah. yeah. Instead of just work, just work out. Sets. Yeah. yeah. Instead, of, instead of going in there, concentrating on what you're doing and, you know, giving a good workout yeah. and you're talking and, you know, you're, you're distracted. Yeah. When you should be concentrating on the workout, mm -hmm. uh, which weakens the workout. Sure. You know, it, we, it's not that good. But you watch them and you say, this can't be. I mean, you can't. And you look around, everybody. Yeah. Then I pull up my phone. <laughs> Let's see his phone. Let's see. I, I do the same thing. I pull up my phone <laughs> and I start talking on it too. You know? Your flip phone. <laughs> There it is. There's my phone. <laughs> Works. Make a telephone call, text. I get <laughs> emails. <laughs> Everything. Wonderful little gadget. All right. Well, anyway, any other parting shots you want to say before? Uh, 
I, I'm looking forward to going on this trip with you. We'll see how it goes. I'll I'll take some film. Yeah, we, I it. think we got it halfway through. Well, we don't have to name people you're going to see, but uh, yeah. You got to name them all. You'll, you'll meet well, them all. Well, I'll meet them all. Yeah. Frank Sh uh, Shula. Uh, I said uh, Nixon, uh, Jennings, Joe Jennings, Lansing, and uh, Luke Hearns, of course. Terry Addis. I don't know if. Uh, Al's going to be there, but uh, yeah, there's going to be a whole big group of people there. I don't know if we're going to have any special speakers come in. We got an and Margaret. I wish. <laughs> I... <laughs> uh, never mind. A long time ago, she doesn't look anywhere near the. I was going to say and Margaret. Right. Yeah. You know, right. I mean, it's like. Uh, you know, just because, you know, you just say you finally met her, you know. I got you. All right. Well, let's say goodbye for now. Okay. <laughs>